Welcome to Better Edge, a Northwestern medicine podcast for physicians. This episode is part three of our Better Edge Parts and Labor mini series. Welcome to Parts and Labor, a roundtable discussion with the OBGYN experts here at Northwestern Medicine. My name is Angela Chaudhary, and I'm a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon and serve as the Chief of Gynecology here at Northwestern Medicine. I will be your host today discussing treatments for uterine fibroids. We have a really amazing panel with me today with my colleagues from the Center of Complex Gynecology here at Northwestern Medicine. First up, Dr. Magdi Malad, the Albert P. B. Gerby Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Division Chief of Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery here at Northwestern Medicine. Dr. Malad is board certified in reproductive endocrinology and infertility with a focused practice designation in minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. Next up, Dr. Susan Tsai, a board-certified and fellowship-trained gynecologic surgeon, associate professor, and the associate program director of the Fellowship in Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery. And next, Dr. Linda Yang, also a fellowship-trained minimally invasive surgeon, associate professor, and assistant program director of our fellowship program here at Northwestern. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Bob Vogelsang, the Albert Nemchek Education Professor of Radiology here at Northwestern Medicine, with a focus on vascular and interventional radiology. He's also the past president of the Society of Interventional Radiology and the previous recipient of the Society of International Radiology Gold Medal Award. Now today, we brought this panel together to start to begin to discuss some treatment options that are available for uterine fibroids. Now before we get started, because there are a lot of treatment options we'll be talking about today, I'd love to hear um, from some of our gynecologists, what are the common symptoms of uterine fibroids? Dr. Yang, do you want to take this one? I would love to. So just kind of starting very broadly, I think patients may come to the office with a variety of fibroid-related symptoms. I would say that most commonly, um, many of our patients will report um, atypical menstrual periods. Um, Often, they will report that their menstrual periods are much heavier than than normal. Um, Also, um, they may report prolonged episodes of menstrual bleeding and occasionally um, irregular bleeding patterns even beyond that. Um, The other types of very common fibroid symptoms I would say that patients will complain of or report to me um, include uh, symptoms related to um, pelvic pain or discomfort. Um, And then another category specific to fibroids are the category of bulk symptoms, um, meaning that because of the substantial space and size that fibroids can take up um, within the uterus and in the pelvic area, then um, patients may report um, sensation of increased um, uh, sense of bladder urgency or frequency um, or potentially impact on uh, bowel movements. Um, And then another category um, that can also be um, uh, reported um, or described by patients is impact on fertility or pregnancy-related complications. So let's break that down, Dr. Yang. We have bleeding, we have pain, we have bulk, and we have it, how it impacts fertility. And I think when we think about how our patients come to us, and we all see these patients every day, right? We think about how do we go about counseling patients about some of our treatment options? Dr. Sai, can you share how you start begin beginning the discussion about medical versus procedural versus surgical treatments? I would love to. So it really depends on the patient and what their goals are. So if we have a, a patient who is younger and is interested in fertility, we might talk more about, depending on where they are in their fertility status and whether or not to, they're ready to start a, a family, is if it's mainly bleeding, we might give her some more medical treatments with some hormonal birth control or some hormones that would potentially turn off their hormones um, to decrease some of that bleeding. If they're getting ready for a pregnancy and they've tried and, and it's impacted them a little bit, we might consider something surgical, which could be removal of the fibroids. <clears throat> For people who potentially don't have a lot of symptoms um, or are not ready to proceed with something potentially as invasive as surgery, we might direct them to our colleagues in interventional radiology for the uterine fibroid embolization procedure. That uh, is so helpful to hear. And I know so many of our colleagues out in the community, when patients come in complaining about bleeding with uterine fibroids, they're often sort of stuck in the scenario of what do we give them? What do we start with? And, and sometimes because they don't know, the patient's bleeding kind of gets thrown under the rug where there are many other medical problems. So it's nice to hear starting with something simple, medical therapies like 
estrogens, progesterones can be really, really beneficial. But you know, I'm sitting here today with a group of proceduralists and surgeons. So let's try to focus in a little bit so our colleagues out in the community can really hear what we're offering our patients from a procedural and surgical standpoint in our office. Dr. Volgazang, can you share with us what the uterine fibroid embolization procedure is? Certainly. Fibroid embolization has been around for about 25, 30 years. I think we've done seven or 8,000 here at Northwestern. And it's a minimally invasive way to treat fibroids by cutting off the blood supply in a simple one-hour procedure, which then proceeds over the next few days, weeks, and months to have the fibroids shrink. And as they shrink, the patient's symptoms improve. Uh, it's an outpatient procedure, and it's been very effective in a variety of situations, including bleeding and bulk. That is really helpful to hear for a lot of our colleagues on the community. I think they think, okay, this is a less invasive procedure. The patients can keep their uteruses, which is obviously of utmost importance to so many of our patients. What do you think the best um, the best uh, symptoms are that are that are that that UAE really treats? I think bleeding and bulk both respond well. Bleeding better than bulk especially for the very large uterus. You know, in other words, we know that uterine fibroid embolization reduces the uterine volume by about 50%. And obviously, if you start with something very large, it's still large when it shrinks by 50%. Now, everybody's a little different. But thankfully, we have other options, and we often use fibroid embolization in conjunction with, for example, myomectomy, laparoscopic myomectomy. And so we do not have a one-size-fits-all in, in this program. You know, that's one of the wonderful things about coming to a center like we have, the Center for Complex Gynecology, where really you get doctors who are working together to find the best treatment options for individual patients. You know, Dr. Malata, I'd love to ask your thoughts about uterine artery embolization. I know you, as I, refer a lot of patients for that procedure. I would love to hear how you counsel patients about the efficacy of that procedure, especially how it may impact their fertility moving forward. Well, as Dr. Vogelzang outlined, uh, it's been around for a long time. It's a very well-established procedure, and there have been hundreds, maybe thousands of pregnancies that have been reported after uterine fibroid embolization. So a, a common myth is that it shouldn't be used in the patient that's interested in fertility, and that's obviously um, established not to be the case. I, I would just reinforce what Dr. Sai indicated, which is just that understanding the patient's priorities is critical, and I think educating the patient so that they can have a shared decision-making about what procedure they think is the best um, because it's, they're the ones that are, obviously have to live with it. Uh, embolization, as I said, uh, has been very reliable and, as um, was suggested earlier, uh, is commonly used with other procedures, uh, whether it's an IUD or whether it's a hysteroscopic myomectomy or a laparoscopic. Uh, maybe, it's, um, maybe the fibroid is sort of pedunculated and preoperative embolization will reduce the ble bleeding at the time of surgery. Um, it's been very versatile uh, in managing patients with symptoms. I think that is a, a really good overview of how we think about embolization and how we sort of refer patients on. I'd love, though, to pick your brain, Dr. Malad, about a newer procedure that's out to treat uterine fibroids, specifically radiofrequency ablation, when do you use that as a therapy for patients? And how do you counsel patients about that? Well, yeah, there's, yeah, there's two uh, devices that are currently FDA approved. <clears throat> they both use rad radiofrequency ablation, which is simply electricity. Uh, there's a common uh, misunderstanding that radiofrequency ablation is some kind of um, magical, unique uh, sort of like uh, Mod modality and it's just simply electricity, Sim similar to what we use in the operating room every single day, every OR in the world. Um, the frequency is um, a high frequency electrical current um, to avoid uh, depolarization. It's bipolar, so they uh, typically will have uh, pads on their thighs. Um, there's two. One is the excessive procedure, which is done under a general anesthetic. There's two incisions, one at the belly button and one uh, below uh, for the ultrasound device, and uh, under the general anesthetic with incisions, um, a probe is placed through the skin uh, and placed into the fibroid or fibroids. It's known as myolysis. Uh, it's a uh, coagulative necrosis, 
Myolysis has been around for like decades, um, but this device has been around since 2013. And then more recently is the Sonata procedure. Sonata is uh, done under a MAC anesthetic, uh, so it's not, there's no incisions at all. It's done transuterine, so um, an ultrasound probe is placed through the cervix into the uterus, and similarly, uh, needles placed into the fibroids and uh, deployed. Typical improvement is uh, approximately 50%, 45 to 50% reduction in overall size, and there have been uh, reports of improved bleeding as well as bulk symptoms with the use of it. Neither are necessarily um, recommended for patients that are interested in pregnancy, although there have been pregnancies reported afterwards. So when we think about these procedural options, it sounds like from both what you said, Dr. Malad, as well as you, Dr. Vogel, saying that really we have so many different procedural options available to patients, sometimes in conjunction with surgery, sometimes on their own. I, I want to talk a little bit more about myomectomy because we keep referring to that procedure as as an alternative for women who want to keep their uteruses, maybe in conjunction with some of the procedures we just talked about, maybe uh, just having those fibroids out on their own. And I, and I know my colleagues at the Center for Complex mm -hmm. Gynecology certainly do a lot of these procedures. Uh, Dr. Yang, what types of patients with fibroids do you recommend myomectomy for? So after discussing all of the treatment options with our patients, I think the reason that myomectomy may come to the forefront in terms of um, the the better choice for a particular patient, I think, as you had mentioned, there are patients who, number one, desire future fertility or who prioritize retention of the, the uterus for um, for either personal reasons or because they truly desire a uterine sparing type of procedure. I think, you know, patients that um, benefit from a myomectomy are patients who have significant bothersome symptoms related to the fibroids, um, including bleeding, uh, bulk symptoms, um, and also, you know, thinking that the goal of a myomectomy is to restore normal anatomy. Um, so potentially for those patients that um, are experiencing fertility-related um, issues from a myoma, um, those are all patients that would benefit from a myomectomy. Now, historically, right, myomectomy used to be these big up and down incisions. I like to call them the myomectomies of our mother's generation, right? So how are we performing these myomectomies now? How are we getting these large fibroids out through now these minimally invasive techniques? Can you describe how that goes? Sure. So I would say that um, a lot has changed in the way that we uh, perform myomectomy, namely our ability to perform essentially the same procedure, but through very small incisions or a very small incision, um, notably laparoscopic myomectomy or robotic assisted myomectomies are one method of removing significant fibroid burden um, without making a large incision or a laparotomy incision. Mini laparotomy is also a very um, re reliable method or approach of uh, performing myomectomy, um, also as a minimally invasive option for our patients. And then, you know, hysteroscopic myomectomy um, for resection of intracavitary or submucosal myomas. So there's so many options out there now for myomectomy, and I think it has to be individualized patient to patient, right? I think that is really what it comes down to is sending patients in to really get a good idea. So many times, you know, patients will come to my office and say, I was sent here for a laparoscopic myomectomy, and they have 22 fibroids. And I say, wait a second, you got to go see Dr. Vogelze. You need an embolization before we can do anything because we need to find every way to save your uterus. And so I think so much depends on what an individual individual patients' needs are, what their anatomy is. But, you know, we mentioned uterine sparing procedures for patients who really just want to keep their uterus. But so many of our patients have delayed childbearing or considering about for, considering fertility in the future. Dr. Malad, can you share, I know you've done lots of research over the years on myomectomy and fertility outcomes. Can you share how you counsel patients about what their fertility outcomes are after myomectomy? Well, sure, I would I would probably take a step back and just su suggest that, uh, as, as you uh, sort of alluded to, uh, fibroids are all about location, uh, location and location. And what's been demonstrated like over and over again is that the fibroids that are intracavitary are the most likely those that are going to impact fertility. And those that are intramural on the, in the wall of the uterus or on the outside of the uterus 
really have not uh, been demonstrated to interfere for, for fertility. So it's not uncommon for patients to be referred in for a myomectomy or for some treatment for fibroids that have, um, for, from a fertility perspective, and yet intramural fibroids, even four centimeters or greater, really have not been demonstrated to be consistently interfering with fertility. Now, if it's a diagnosis of exclusion, there's nothing else. They've failed IVF a number of times. Maybe in that specific setting, there's nothing else to do. It's worth trying. But just want to reinforce like how important location is and be able to counsel around uh, which fibroids should be removed and which one's not. And of course, the larger the fibroid it is, the more, the more likely it's going to interfere with fertility. With regards to pregnancy outcome, we still don't really have <laughs> great data on this topic with regards to the need for C-section, um, but um, we still follow the old adages of uh, uh, fibroid entering myomectomy, I'm sorry, myomectomy uh, entering cavity, uh, cavity entering fibroid <laughs> surgery uh, potentially is going to recommend a C-section. But it's, it's very dependent on their obstetrician and also where they're located. If a patient is in rural Montana, <clears throat> any type of myomectomy may be enough to prompt a C-section versus one that's in a more urban area. So I, I, try, I try not to advise extensively about whether they're, they're going to need a C-section or not after, after myomectomy. I think that's so, it's such a personal discussion between the patient and their obstetrician. Obviously, getting as much information from us, uh, doing the surgeries as they can, but I completely agree, Dr. Malad. Now, you know, it's funny, we talked about procedures and we talked about myomectomies, all these uterine sparing procedures, but certainly there are many patients who are finished and completed their childbearing who are at their wits end, whether it's bleeding, bulk, pain, they're, they're there and they're ready to have something that is completely uh, finishing their bleeding. And so many of our patients have had these procedures or they've had multiple myomectomies and now they're ready for hysterectomy. Dr. Sai, how do you counsel patients about the option for hysterectomy? As we kind of discussed and alluded to before, it's really all about patient preference, right? So if it's a bleeding issue and you've counseled them about medical management or potentially fibroid embolization, but ultimately they just want to be done, hysterectomy is the ultimately the only one way that we can stop their bleeding. Um, so whether or not we approach it um, through the different routes that we have, so laparoscopically, robotically, vaginally, um, are all routes that we can discuss depending on their prior histories. And then we have to go into talking about do you want to keep the cervix or remove the cervix? And so we talk about what we call super cervical or subtotal hysterectomies, where we keep the cervix. So in those patients, we would continue to do pap smears. We may counsel them that they may still have some bleeding because if we don't cut low enough on the cervix, they might still have some cyclical monthly bleeding. Total hysterectomy really just refers to the uterus. In this case, we're removing the area where the fibroids are, um, as well as the cervix. In this case, then, there would be no more need for pap smears unless someone had a history of abnormal ones that required uh, further surveillance. Um, I kind of always tell people the uterus is like a hot air balloon. So we're going to move the balloon, the strings, and the bottom of the basket. <laughs> That's what a total hysterectomy is. <laughs> I love it. Now, I would love for someone to comment because how many patients do we get in saying, I want a partial hysterectomy? You just heard Dr. Sai mention total hysterectomy, super cervical hysterectomy. What in the world, Dr. Yang, is a partial hysterectomy? You know, I think that there is a tendency um, when using vague terms like that, that it may not be clear as to the type of surgery that you're performing and what you're actually removing. So in patients who use those um, terms, I actually like to be very specific, sometimes even like drawing a picture of what the uterus and cervix are, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries, so that I can um, explain that a total hysterectomy actually relates specifically to the uterus and cervix and really doesn't include um, uh, the removal of the ovaries. Um, I think patients, when they come in fearful sometimes of a total hysterectomy, what they're truly fearful of potentially is removing um, the uterus and cervix as well as the ovaries. Whereas when they express a preference for a partial hysterectomy, um, to be very clear about what their preferences are in terms of of retention of the cervix versus retention of the ovaries, um, where a partial hysterectomy could actually mean different things. Um, so I think like to be very um, specific. 
Yeah, I feel like we constantly are nailing down those um, those rumors out there that it happened in patients' families or from their friends. And are you having a are you having a total or a partial? You should get a partial so you don't go into menopause. But what we know is that right, the ovaries have separate blood supplies. They're not going to go into menopause with the total hysterectomy. It is just the hot air balloon, as Doctor Sai <laughs> called it. You know, the basket, the the strings, and the and the and the balloons. So, you know. As we wrap up our discussion today about treatment options, I think one of the things that really sets the Center for Complex Gynecology and Northwestern Medicine apart is our approach to this combined multimodal therapy for uterine fibroids. It's really an excellent collaboration between our gynecologic surgeons and our interventional radiology physicians. And, you know, I just love to hear Dr. Malad and Dr. Vogelzang have been sort of at the forefront of this for so many years working together to, to really get the patients the options that they need. Um, Dr. Vogelzang, I'd love to hear when you think multimodal therapy is at its best and, and what types of procedures or patients do you really think uh, you know, do well with this type of technique? It's a great question. Multimodal therapy or therapy that includes one or more, usually two types, means that for us, myomectomy and embolization are not competitive, they're complementary. So I'll give you a few examples of that. Uh, it's very often that Dr. Malad will refer to me a patient in whom they have uh, large fibroids, which we know will probably be bulk problematically from a bulk perspective, but also may have innumerable smaller fibroids. Because embolization is a global treatment, we're going to treat all the smaller ones, of course, and then the larger ones can be resected, usually at some, some interval. Uh, we had a patient the other day who was emblematic of that. Uh, she works in the Department of Radiology, wanted to avoid a hysterectomy, and we did an embolization. She got some reduction. But Dr. Malad then did a laparoscopic myomectomy. And that's the other thing that's really beautiful about this collaboration is that you downsize and uh, reduce the size of the uterus. So sometimes or very often laparoscopic procedures are available when previously they were too large and could only be done open. So how does this work? Do these procedures happen the same day? Is there a time frame between those two procedures? No, they usually happen at an interval, although they can happen the same day, as you know. Um, but they are complementary, and that I think we're working at a very high level that's unique, well, perhaps in the United States. Many examples of that are use of MR, for example, to identify fibroids. And uh, we could go on and on, but we are trying to give the patients the best options and produce the best results, I think, as a consequence. Yeah. Dr. Malad, when these when patients come in and, and do multimodal therapy with you, how do you counsel them on outcomes and recovery from going through more than one procedure for their fibroids? Well, <clears throat> generally, I counsel around, I mean, I, th I would, a counseling uh, around multimodal therapy um, is unique because we have, we have the risks and complications of each of the procedures sort of individually. But the hope is that by combining the two, we can reduce the overall risks. Um, because we have so much experience with it, it's pretty easy to counsel around outcomes. And um, we have rarely seen a problem with it. Um, it was There were some initial learning curves with it uh, with regards to consenting patients for surgery. So uh, if they have an embolization under a MAC anesthetic, uh, you can't really consent them for a procedure the same day. Um, and so we've had to sort of strategize around how to resolve that. And obviously, we did that many years ago. Um, patients can be quite uh, drowsy uh, after two procedures. Um, and it really isn't necessary to sort of do it all on the same day. Uh, in fact, there's some advantage to waiting, doing an embolization a day before, a week before, a month before, even three months before. Oftentimes, we'll do it uh, an embolization preoperatively, and patients have such improved symptoms that they end up canceling their surgery or putting it off until they feel like they need it. I would just add one more specific um, indication for multimodal therapy, and that's the patient that has these really vascular fibroids. Um, even if we can approach it hysteroscopically, um, we see on ultrasound Doppler flow, really un a unique amount of blood supply to it and 
preoperative embolization has been enormously helpful in reducing bleeding and also being able to be able to finish the procedure uh, all in the one setting. It seems like there's so many benefits to this multimodal therapy, you know, blocking blood flow, uh, potentially uh, decreased surgical time, potentially even improved outcomes in the long term because we're shrinking these smaller fibroids and immediately taking out these larger, bulky fibroids. Uh, it's so exciting to hear uh, and to share, you know, some of the work that we're doing here that really is very cutting edge. As, as Dr. Vogelzing mentioned, this is, you know, one of the first centers in the country that's really using this complementary therapy for our patients. You know, I just really want to thank all of our panelists today for being here and, and talking to our colleagues out there about what treatment options are available for uterine fibroids. Before we finish up today, I'd love to hear any final takeaways for, for our colleagues who are referring patients to us. Dr. Vogelzang, you want to start? You bet. I, I think your patient's going to be well managed here. We are going to take care of them in the best possible way, often in a single visit, for example, at the Center for Complex Gynecology and we will find the best solution for them. That is That says it all, I feel like. <laughs> Dr. Mala, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the, the mission of the center is really to take care of complex conditions that uh, either are outside the a generalist practice uh, or something that they just don't want to deal with. And our intention is not to steal the patient or keep the patient, but really to just manage their complex issue and send them back to the referring doctors. And so... Uh, and everything about the center is directed around that mission. Yeah. Dr. Yang, Dr. Sai? I would just add that, you know, in terms of um, from a patient perspective, that when they come to see myself or any one of um, my wonderful colleagues that really we're trying to educate the patient, um, uh, potentially about options that they've never heard about before. So they may not leave the office with necessarily a decision about what to do, but they will walk away with a better understanding um, of the options that they have. I want to echo Dr. Yang. I think it is all about education and we sometimes with working with our residents and our fellows have that time to really educate them. And they, and they leave, I think, as she said, with a better understanding, not necessarily different information, but just a better understanding of it. Yeah, I think we really hit on all sort of uh, the, the, the topics about treatment for uterine fibroids that I think many of our colleagues that are listening in want to learn about, want to hear more about, because they want to go back and offer this to their patients that are coming in and really suffering from the bleeding, the bulk, the pain. I just really want to thank our amazing panel today. Thank you for everyone out there listening. And, you know, here at the Center for Complex Gynecology, we're more than happy to see patients, uh, get second opinions, and really be here as a source of education for your patients to make the best individualized and personalized decision for them. Thank you so much. To refer your patient or for more information, please visit our website at breakthroughsforphysicians.nm.org slash OBGYN. That concludes this episode of Better Edge, a Northwestern Medicine podcast for physicians. Please always remember to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and all the other Northwestern Medicine podcasts. 